Oh, <laughs> man, oh, man. Happy Easter, everybody. I tell you what, happy Easter, South Barrington. But can I celebrate with you that we are streaming live to all of our campuses for the first time ever. So we are going to say happy Easter to Crystal Lake. We're going to say happy Easter to Wheaton and South Lake and North Shore and Chicago and Huntley. I was at Huntley last night, and the Easter celebration is just in full swing. And I tell you what, as soon as we get some decent musicians around here, I think we got a shot, okay? Can we give it up for the band at all of our campuses? Man! <laughs> Woo! I, it's just something about Easter. The musicians always take it up a notch, don't they? Just incredible. It's like, you know, the Super Bowl of church. And uh, we love that. It's hard to, it's even hard to imagine Easter without incredible music, you know? I mean, I guess you could, you could celebrate Easter without the music. We could all come in here and, you know, you could, you could uh, you know, read the Easter story say a couple prayers, and then go home, you know. Uh, probably, get, probably get done a lot earlier, right? And go beat the Baptists over the pancake house. That'd be nice, but, <laughs> but it just wouldn't be the same. I'm so grateful that God created beautiful music with which we get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Man, I love that. You know what else I love about Easter is Easter Food. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. You're about to go home in just a little bit and have that honey-baked ham. That's a spiritual experience, all right? You're about to go get some breakfast casserole. You're about, I see some kids in the crowd. How many of you like Easter candy, right? Who, do you like the, um, the marshmallow peeps? Anybody raise your hand? Really? Really? That stuff is that they grow that in a laboratory. That's not even real Food. How many of you, your favorite Easter food is jelly beans like Jesus taught us in the Bible to love, right? <laughs> I love that God created music with which to celebrate Easter. I love that he created good food with which we can celebrate Easter. I love the Easter colors. It seems like this is the weekend where the pastels explode onto the scene. This is the time. And, and God didn't have to do that. Everything could have been just, you know, sort of a sh different shades of gray. But decorating the Easter eggs wouldn't be as fun. Those spring flowers that are about to explode wouldn't be as inspirational. And the little kids showing up in all their little pastel dresses and their pastel clip-on ties, it just wouldn't be the same. God created a beautiful world. Now, some of you are going, Pastor, why are we talking about all this creation, all these images of creation, all this story of creation? It's Easter Sunday. And I would say to you, it's because the story of Easter begins with God creating a beautiful world. Back at the beginning of the Bible, he created and he created and he created, and then he looked at it and he called it good. In fact, he called it really good, and everything was just beautiful. But then the story skipped ahead a couple of chapters, and it only took a couple of chapters. And human beings rebelled against God's beautiful design. And God's beautiful design was then broken. And just like we could celebrate many beautiful images on Easter Sunday, we could also show pictures of natural disasters, or famine, or war, or racism, or poverty, of loss, depression, addiction, the pain of divorce, and even death. You see, not everything this Easter is beautiful. There's a lot in our world that's actually pretty broken. And especially coming out of this past year, do you remember last year's Easter? We had just been quarantined. And this past year has been difficult. 
It's played havoc on some of our mental health. I mean, goodness, you, you rolled, few, uh, rolled forward a couple of months after Easter last year, and we had racial tension like our country has never seen before. It's just incredible. And then we had, um, and then we had a volatile election. And in some ways, the brokenness out there is troubling, but in some ways, the brokenness out there isn't the most troubling. In some ways, it's the brokenness in here that gives me the most pause. That's part of the Easter story as well. Romans 3.23 says, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious ideals, his beautiful design. And I could raise my hand and say, yeah, I'm a part of that. I mean, goodness gracious, I've looked in the mirror at, at times in seasons, in moments, and I've said, goodness, I don't even need to talk about God's standards. I haven't even lived up to my own. I mean, maybe you understand what that feels like. There are some times that I look in the mirror and I think, goodness, I, there are things that I don't want to do, and yet I do them. And there are things that I know, good things that I know that I should do that I just can't get myself to do sometimes. And I look in the mirror and I think, I just don't know if in this season, like sometimes I'm not the man that I want to be. Sometimes I'm not the father that I want to be. I'm not the friend that I want to be sometimes. And sometimes I'm not the husband that I promised to be. And I can look around, maybe you can too, some days and realize that my life is far from beautiful and I feel far from God's beautiful design, sometimes even far from the God who created that beauty. Part of the Easter story is that when God saw the brokenness of our world, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, and one of the things that Jesus did when he was on this earth was teach us, many times with parables. These were stories that Jesus would use to teach us truth about God. And one such story in Luke 15 is very interesting to me because this Easter for me feels in many ways like we're coming out of the brokenness and back to God. At least that's my desire, to come back to God, out of the brokenness. And there's a story that Jesus tells in Luke 15 about a young man who really understands brokenness and coming back to the Father. In Luke 15, Jesus starts and he says, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Eventually, Jesus would say that the money ran out. This kid got so desperate to survive, he started eating pig food from pig troughs. In desperation, he decides to go back to his father. In verse 18, I will set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. Now pause right there. Because the people that were hearing Jesus tell this story would have known all about the Kizaza. Ashley Woolridge, a pastor friend of mine down in Phoenix, and he, he showed me this. And so I, I've started doing some research on this. This was a, a legal ceremony. It was a, 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 a ceremony in the Talmud, the Hebrew law book, where if you had a son or a daughter that disgraced you, if you had a family member that embarrassed you in, in, in uh, living or that was immoral, you could actually call for a kizaza. It's where people would come and they'd take a pot and they would, it's called, the, it's the cutting off ceremony. And by way of cutting off the family member, they would take the pot and they would smash it in front of the person to say, hey, you know, shame on you and, and we want you out of here. I mean, literally, as Jesus is telling this story, I wonder if people are imagining, oh, this must be a Kizaza moment when this kid is coming back home after squandering his 
father's inheritance and wild living. Now what they would do is they would, they, they would gather at the city gate and they would, they would take these pots and they would fill them with disgusting things, rotten food. They would fill them with animal dung. And they would gather together and when that young man would have come to that gate, they would have taken those pots and seen him and with angry faces just went, ah! shame on you. Our relationship is cut off. It's broken. Your future hopes, they're dashed. Your relationship with this village, with this family is cut off. It is broken. And it breaks my heart to imagine that there would be some people who would be running out of the brokenness of their life and coming back to church or coming back to God, imagining that God might have a pot with their name on it. Because Jesus tells a completely different story. He paints a completely different picture of the father. In verse 20, he says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him he ran to his son now I'm imagining the father running past people holding pots pulling them back so he could run to his son not to get to his son to wag a shaming finger to to shake an angry fist but to wrap his arms around his son it says that he wrapped his arms around him and kissed him <laughs> Jesus said he put a ring on his finger sandals on his feet this is an indication that he's saying no I don't want you as a hired hand I want you as a son I want you to have full authority and rights as a son in verse 24 he, he turns around to the the, the, uh, the, the, the um, servants and he says prepare a feast we're going to have a party we're going to celebrate verse 24 for this son of mine was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and so they began to celebrate and what everyone thought was a moment of brokenness turned out to be a moment of beauty. In my research on the Kizay Za, I found another pottery tradition. It comes to us out of Japan and it's called the Kintsugi. And what's interesting about the kintsugi is that when a pot is broken in Japan, there are folks that would look at the broken pieces and not say, you know what, let's just sweep this up and call it garbage and just throw it away as worthless. But they actually take the pieces and they fuse them back together. But what's fascinating to me is that they don't fuse it back together with you know, cement or superglue. They use pure gold and the value of the restored artwork is greater than its original design I mean if that's not a picture of our Easter Jesus I don't know what is our Jesus who gave up the rights of heaven and ran down to meet people who were broken. Jesus, who came down to meet us to say, not shame on you, but let me get the shame off of you. Let me take the shame upon myself. That Good Friday moment where Jesus is actually running through the streets past people that were accusing him, past people that were mocking him, past people that were saying, ah, we're cutting you off. A week ago we said, oh, Sean, yeah, but today we say crucify him. We're cutting you off, Jesus. And he's carrying a cross up a hill. The cross, the, I mean, the, the, the perfect, most powerful symbol of brokenness a symbol of, they used it as execution, as torture. And yet because of Jesus, he's able to turn it around, to transform it into a beautiful symbol that now we decorate our homes with it. We, we hang it around our neck. Our Jesus, who carried that cross up a hill, 
and who took upon himself all of the brokenness, all of the sin, all of the shame, all of the accusation. He takes it upon himself in an act of stretching out his arms, an act of love, just like that father stretched out his arms in an act of love. And it's not gold that fuses a broken pot back together, but as Jesus' blood poured out, that fuses our lives back together, that takes our broken relationship with God the Father and fuses it back together. Because his body was broken, our lives can be beautifully restored. The Easter story doesn't end there. Jesus on the cross. You know, at any moment, the king of the world, the king of heaven could have, could have called down a legion of angels to wipe out his accusers. At any moment, he could have called down a legion of angels to tend to his wounds, but he didn't. He stayed there. He kept himself on the cross. He could have saved himself, but he kept himself there to save us, to save you. He was in charge. He was the one. No one took his life from him. He was the one that said, it is finished. He was the one that said, into, uh, it is into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's him that, that, that said, it is now time. And then he died. And as the story reads, when Jesus died, the earth shook. When Jesus died, darkness came over the land. When Jesus died, the veil in the temple that, folks, was about four inches thick of material and 60 feet high, and yet it ripped from top to bottom, taking the separation from where God dwelt and opening that up to all the people. It was as if God was saying, I want to run to you. All that happened when Jesus died. It even said when Jesus died that dead people came out of the grave when Jesus died. Oh, but the Easter story didn't even end there. They took him off of the cross and they prepared his body. They wrapped it in linens. They wrapped it in spices and they put it in the grave. And Friday night and Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon and Saturday night it was in the grave. And in those days... The world must have seemed more broken than ever before. But on Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, Jesus rose from the dead. And it's not a fable, it's not a fairy tale, and it's not fiction. It's history. Jesus rose from the dead. It is fact. It is a miracle. It is God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son. <laughs> And he rose from the dead. I love the way Paul talks about it. Verse 4 in, uh, in Ephesians, he says, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's a very important part of the Easter story. And that's the choice that you get to make about how to celebrate it. If you're watching me right now at all of our campuses and you've said yes to Jesus, then I would remind you to celebrate Easter by remembering that you are God's masterpiece created to do good things. And if you've not yet said yes to Jesus, can I draw your attention to verse 5 one more time it says that even though we were dead because of our sins he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead you might be here today and say you know what 
when I think hope in my life, that's dead. My faith, it's as good as dead. The peace, no, there's a peace of mind, that's dead. And I would say that's okay. Because we're here celebrating a God that specializes in bringing dead things back to life. You say, you don't understand my career. I'm in a dead-end career. I would say that's okay because God knows how to take dead things and resurrect them. You say, you know what? I, my hope for the future, my dreams for the future, they're dead. That's okay. You say, you know what? My love for my spouse, my marriage is as good as dead. I would say that's okay because we celebrate today a God who specializes in bringing dead things back to life. Will you choose him today? Will you come home to Jesus? Will you say yes to Jesus? At all of our campuses, in just a few minutes, a campus pastor will come and help you make that decision. But for all of us here, all of us at all of our campuses, I want you to know that over the last 2,000 years, the choice that has been made by the church is to celebrate Easter Sunday by reading a certain passage of Scripture. And at the end of that passage of Scripture, on every Easter, in so many different places all around the world, for 2,000 years, at the end of that Scripture, it ends with, He is risen. And the pastor would say, he is risen. And the congregation would shout back, he is risen indeed. And far be it from me to stop a tradition that's been going on for 2,000 years. So if it's okay for you, I'd like to play the role of the pastor. <laughs> and y'all can play the role of the congregation. And if you'll say yes to Jesus today, if you'll celebrate Jesus as the risen Lord, then when I say he is risen, you say he is risen indeed. Are you ready? Feels like we should stand up for this one. Let's all stand everywhere we are. Luke 24 says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. He has risen indeed. He has risen he has risen indeed. He has risen. He has risen indeed. Yes.